Viewer discretion is advised. Chapter 14 Malice Trevor now found himself in a darkened haze. A haze that brought with it the cold realities of the events that had just transpired. After being attacked through his shattered window, he didn't remember much. But one thing that he did remember played over and over within his mind like a relentless nightmare seeping through his entire being, controlling every thought. And as he slowly began to regain his bearings, he looked around within the quagmire that used to be their only way out of this cat and mouse scenario. Him and his companions had been trapped in over the last couple of weeks. As he mustered up the courage to look upon his sister once more, he tried to shake his most recent image of her rattling within his head, hoping it was perhaps just a bad dream. But to Trevor's dismay, as he once again peered over at Beck, just like before, there where her eye had once been, a bullet wound was now instead. Beck, he whispered. Beck, no. Please, no. And as a tear began to slip from his own eye, a hint of hope washed over his face as he immediately drew his attention back to his sister. He could hear her trying to speak. Beck, he whispered once more. As he held his gaze intently upon her lips, he could see them slightly move in another attempt to speak once more. But then, whisking him swiftly away from a hopeful demeanor, horror set in as Beck quickly sat up and lunged at her brother, sitting in the passenger seat of the now defunct vehicle, and met him face to face. Blood now dripping from her gaping wound onto Trevor, as she let out a few unnerving words. Wake up, Trevor. You must save them. You must save yourself. Trevor was suddenly punched in the gut, bringing him out of his brief, dark dream. And as a man withdrew his fist, Trevor regained consciousness, his hands now tied behind him, leaning against a tree. The vehicle now, not in sight. It was dark and very cold as he tried to focus his sights. The man who had assaulted him was just a dark silhouette as he stepped back at the sight of Trevor awakening. Just then, another man stepped forward and kneeled down near him and spoke. Wake up, Trevor. The stranger then reached behind him and grabbed a duffel bag, 
that Trevor immediately recognized. It was the one he had been carrying for the last day or so. It was one they had found amongst other bags in a vehicle, back at Vuelta Larga, the one they had unwittingly stole from a cartel soldier hiding out nearby after being set free by the American forces. The man then used a knife as he cut one of the seams of the bag and pulled out a small, thin, black object with a blinking red light. The man leaned into Trevor and spoke with a lowered voice. We have eyes everywhere. Trevor, now knowing that this sadistic cat and mouse game was back in play, rolled his eyes, partially with frustration, leaving the remainder of his expression defined by utter confusion. He tossed his head back, causing a small sound as he hit the tree behind him. He winced in pain from the bruising he had incurred from the prior, thrashing accident, joined with a new discomfort from the most recent assault. His aggressor began speaking once more, while Trevor noticed two men standing behind the stranger. I know what you're thinking. Is she dead? He said as he leaned in closer. He looked at Trevor while pointing at his own left eye as he proceeded to devilishly regale his hostage of the gut-wrenching demise of his fallen sister. The bullet went through this eye. It was shot quite a distance away, so the thermoscope was very useful. Although, once hitting the glass, and then having to also penetrate a human skull, the bullet was slowed down significantly. I'm afraid it's still in your sister's head. As the man said this, Trevor noticed laughing coming from the men behind the man speaking. He began to look around as his focus was finally beginning to sharpen, and also as his captor continued speaking. I don't think you need to worry about her anymore. If I were you, I would worry about the little boy in the car. I fear his wounds may cause him to die. After all, that was a terrible accident you and your family just went through. Do you think it might help if I remove the large piece of glass from his neck? No, I know. You can do that after digging through your sister's little skull. I'd like to save the bullet. You know, for sentimental reasons. Trevor could hear the laughing continue as his rage grew within him. He began to feel this rage settle in as he kept trying to piece together anything he could do to get Caleb and Delilah away from this place. Far, far away. It was very dark as he looked at the grassy soil around him, surrounded by trees to one side and the bank leading up to the expressway on the other. He noticed a rock protruding from the dirt right next to him as one of the men crossed over his field of vision, carrying a pistol strapped to his thigh. Then he began to take in a small sense of hope as he moved his hands around in the dirt behind him and stumbled across what felt like a rather sharp rock. This one though, the man continued. I think we might keep her. My men get so lonely. You understand, right? That's when he saw Delilah for the first time. Barely able to make out her face from the moon's dull glow, he could tell that she was crying. Then, one of the other men pulled her by the hand as they threw her onto the ground. The man who threw her kneeled down by her and caressed her long hair while grasping a knife, as its sharp edge grazed the small child's face, looking to Trevor with a sinister grin. Trevor gripped the sharp rock while an intense sensation of murderous anger swept through his body. His face grew angry as he looked at the man in front of him, now addressing Trevor once more. I don't know about you, but I think she's going to grow into a beautiful woman someday, if she makes it that long. I don't know, though. Your group has surprised us before. She might be like you, a little fighter. We might have to spend some time really brainwashing this one. If she's anything like her role models, she could be a good asset. You know, amongst other things, he said as he looked back at his men who were still laughing quietly, one still holding the little girl down. Then he looked back to Trevor and continued his sick monologue. What do you think, Trev? You think this one has some fight in her? 
Trevor was listening to the men continue to laugh as his anger only grew more inside him. He looked at his shadowy enemy and responded with a snarl in his breath, pain in his posture, and disdain in his words. Fuck you, he muttered while wincing from the pain he was feeling. I am gonna kill all of you. No one moved in response to Trevor's remarks. They just looked at one another and laughed, the leader of the small group refocusing on their prisoner. And how do you see that happening, my friend? Trevor finally matched their menacing expressions as a smile filled with pure hatred slowly stretched across his bloody face. He continued to speak while looking at each one of them, making sure they all felt included in his plan. First, I'm gonna knock that guy out cold, he said while nodding his direction at one of the men, causing his aggressor to look in the same direction and then back at his hostage as Trevor continued. Then I'm gonna stab that one in the throat. And then, finally, he stated, pausing for a moment and smiling more confidently. And as his smile reached its maximum, he proceeded foretelling their fates. Then I'm going to make you eat your own fucking gun. This time, the leader of the three showed a slight hint of hesitation, having witnessed his hostage's capabilities in the recent weeks as he pathetically tried hiding it with his menacing laughter and ordered one of his men to secure Trevor. Tighten his bounds. We can't take any chances with this one. One of the men, listening to his commander, crossed in front of his boss and began walking around Trevor as he passed between the two. Trevor took advantage of his window and stretched his legs out and clasped the man's feet with his legs and then drew them quickly back causing the man to fall face forward. The man then fell flat on his face next to Trevor, slamming his forehead into a nearby protruding rock. Fragments of bone, painted red from dripping blood, broke around the rock's sharp edges. And as soon as this happened, the leader backed off to retrieve his weapon as the man that once had Delilah in his grips let go of the little girl and sprung towards Trevor in an attempt to subdue their hostage. But Trevor effortlessly rose to his feet as a rush of adrenaline took over. And causing the man to stop dead in his tracks, Trevor faced his enemy's advance as he pulled both of his now freed hands from around his back with a sharp rock still in one, and immediately closing the distance between him and his attacker, not letting a second slip by, allowing his enemies to think he lunged towards the threat. He pushed his fist forward, clutching the sharp rock and slit his enemy's throat with his newly acquired shiv. As he heard the sound of a gun being readied, he embraced the man he had just slaughtered, pulled him to his own body, not allowing the dying man to fall to the ground, and turned into the direction of the noise. And using the nearly dead body like a shield, the gun finally sounded off, sending a bullet toward Trevor, but only hitting the shooter's comrade instead. Once the small piece of metal penetrated the corpse, Trevor threw the carcass aside and advanced toward his final enemy. And as he tackled the last man, forcing the two into a tumble through the grass, another shot sounded off. Trevor had been shot in the gut. The man then tightened his grip around his gun, attempting to retrain it on his escaped hostage and deliver another blow as they tumbled through the jungle. They wrestled for several seconds until finally, a shot was fired as another bullet sank into Trevor's left side just above his waist. But, as if unfazed from the ordeal of being shot now twice, Trevor kept fighting, slowly overpowering the man, eventually gaining control of his captor's hand still gripping the gun. And though the other man was still holding the weapon, Trevor forced his hands to turn it on himself as his enemy let out a yell. Ah! Trevor then kneeled on his adversary's chest, as the man was quickly met with his own gun being shoved forcefully into his mouth. He pushed the gun in as far as he could, while letting out sounds only one could describe as animalistic or psychotic. Finally, as he now held the gun down the throat of his enemy, he leaned in and spoke. I hope you burn. And with that, he squeezed the trigger, ushering a bullet through the skull of the man he now held down under his knees.
It was a peaceful dawn over the desolate town of Valdevia as the early morning sun, unlike the day before, effortlessly made its way through the clear skies, beckoning the hours of mid-morning. After the storm had rolled through, the soil of the jungles let off a familiar aroma one might recognize as an after-rain perfume. The open sea air swept through the trees and orchestrated a symphony of calm as leaves fluttered about the jungle's canopy. The woodland grounds were dutifully in sync with their skyward neighbors as wild birds continued their chirping in the distance, composing a song of profound serenity. Alongside the edge of the forest lay a strip of grassy embankment that ran along a deserted and once scenic highway. Upon this strip of muddy grass, Trevor, barely stumbling along while holding a gun with his left hand and shouldering a sickly pale Caleb with his right, made his way on foot. Delilah, now walking right next to him, looked at Trevor with fear in her eyes as his wounds in his stomach, now bandaged with cloth, ripped from his enemy's clothes just hours ago, continuously bled out. As the trio made their way, Trevor and Delilah each held a somber silence. His lower half was completely drenched in blood as he periodically checked his poorly wrapped wound by rubbing his fingers along it. The three continued along, leaving droplets of blood dripping down the blades of grass they passed over. Delilah kept her eye on Trevor, every now and then looking up at him. But his face was always the same. Though she kept hearing signs of discomfort come from her uncle, he never changed his facial expression, always calm and focused on the path ahead of them. But then, something did change. She began to hear sounds coming from behind them as she turned around and looked. Trevor, too, focused on walking and keeping his injuries from his mind, followed her lead to see what she had heard. The sight nearly made him vomit as he looked off into the distance and saw a convoy of vehicles racing their way. He looked to Delilah, cueing her to follow his lead as they began running. He peered over at the forest and contemplated ducking for cover, but could not imagine negotiating the mildly rough terrain in his condition. He could not think of a better plan as he gently set Caleb on the ground and checked his gun for a bullet count. Suddenly becoming very dizzy, he lost his balance and hit the dirt, landing right next to Caleb. And as he clutched the little boy's dying body, he reached out for Delilah's hand while dropping his gun in the process. As he looked at her, not knowing if she was looking back as his vision had become severely blurry and distorted, he managed to get out one final word. Run. He didn't remember much after that, except for strangely lying on the highway. But didn't he collapse on the grass? He thought to himself, and who is this? And as he faded in and out, he noticed a blurry figure now kneeling over him. His hearing was coming and going, but he made sense of a few of the words that were being spoken around him. Clean. This one's clean too. Get him in with the others. A large portion of the current events were not making any sense, and he wanted it all to end, as he felt himself being carried away on what felt like a stretcher of some kind. He was tired of getting free just to be caught again. But then, just as he needed it the most, a small hand reached out and grabbed two of his fingers. He felt Delilah, and he felt her walking next to him as he saw he was being carried by multiple American soldiers. A smile slowly made its way across his face, which just seemed to make his wounds hurt even more. But he couldn't care less. Then, he finally managed to get out a few small words before passing out. Where's Caleb? One of the soldiers looked down at him and replied, Medic has him. They're working on him right now. Just rest. We're almost there. Just then, everything around him seemed to grow dark as a large hovering aircraft made its way over his head. It wasn't like anything he had ever seen before. The aircraft must have been the size of a large stadium. His eyes closed as he managed to hear a few last words from a soldier before going unconscious. There she is. There's Sanctuary. 
Trevor now found himself in a peaceful environment as he looked out toward the lake and admired how the sunlight washed over its surface while ripples of traveling waves carried the light's reflection with an effortless sense of grace. Ever since he could remember, from being a small boy, his family would come here for some time away from the rest of the busy world around them. He looked back in an attempt to gain his bearings as he gazed at his grandfather's lake house. It was surrounded by the large ponderosa pine trees that gathered in tight clusters throughout the surrounding forest. While he peered at the cabin, a familiar sense of calm swept through his body as he became comfortable, as if a security blanket of childhood memories seemed to cloak him in a tight embrace. When Trevor switched his gaze back to the pier, a rush of warmth overtook him as he laid his eyes on his older sister, now sitting at the edge of the dock, her blonde hair radiantly glowing in the sun like an angel. He found the small walk to his sister to be somewhat cathartic, as he knew this was some kind of dream, yet reveled in the mere sight of her as he came closer. Now, standing next to her, he peered out into the lake and enjoyed the beauty of the watery surface with his older sister, as they allowed a calming silence to dominate their reunion for a brief moment. I always loved the sunset here. Beck said she kept her view on the lake's glossy surface. I remember we would fall asleep right here as the sun disappeared behind those mountains. Trevor looked down at his sister, fully understanding her description of the childhood memory they had often shared together. He slowly took a seat next to her just inches away, not wanting the mirage to disappear by disturbing the memories now materializing before him. He continued to look out at the water, matching the sights his sister held within his own mind as he responded to her with a hushed tone. Mom and Dad would let us sleep out here every night, he said as he looked over at her. He noticed her relaxed, peaceful smile, which seemed to upset him as it reminded him that it was a sight that was quickly being removed from his life forever. As he looked down, he saw her hands gently gripping a smooth rock as she spoke of their sublime memories they shared together as she continued to speak. They'll always be here, Trevor, somewhere out there at the bottom. We did that together. Trevor looked at her, unable to speak. He wanted to beg her to not throw the stone, worried with an intense fear that it would quickly usher the end to his small reunion with his departed older sibling. Instead, all he could do was manage a few words to creep past the thick lump, now swollen within his throat, as a tear began to slip from the corner of his left eye. I don't want to go through this without you, he said as he looked back down at his trembling hands. He listened closely to her next words, as fear of his sister never talking to him again began to take its utterly depressive hold over his entire being. I love you, Trev. Others need you now. Your journey isn't over. You need to let me go. You need to be there for them. You don't know how important they really are. And then, causing him to look at her with confusion, she looked over and said a few more words. You aren't in a good place, Trev. They still have you. You need to get out. You need to get everybody out. More tears ran down his face, as he couldn't even begin to question the puzzling words she spoke, as his confused face did all the talking. He peered over to his sister, but now found himself sitting on the docks of his childhood memories, quiet and helplessly alone. Beck was now gone. Then, he looked out into the distance as he saw a smooth stone plunk into the water's still surface causing a slight disturbance within its glassy entrance. It had been several weeks since they were rescued. Trevor stood there in the grass as he held a quiet gaze. He was wearing thin cloth pants. He could still feel a bandage on one of his calves underneath them where a GPS tracker had recently been surgically removed. And Delilah, at his side, held his hand as they both stood in silence while they looked at the ground. Both wearing their new clothes and staring at the ground together, Delilah decided to break the silence. 
I think it's pretty, she said, while not looking away from the ground. Trevor agreed in response. I think you're right, Delilah, he said as he looked over at her with a small smile and then back to the tiny gravesite below them. The small grave was comprised of a modest, sized, grassy mound with a short stone slab erected in the middle of the tiny hill. Trevor looked over as he noticed Caleb reaching up for his opposite hand while smiling up at his uncle. He looked down at the small boy, who still had a bandage wrapped around his neck, and said a few words. I think your Aunt Beck will love our new home. Even if her body is not physically here, she'll always be with us. He looked back and forth, from one small child to the other, and continued. Now you guys can come here anytime you want to talk to her. Or talk to any of them, okay? They stood there as silence once again wrapped them in its warm embrace while they admired the thin stone slab. On it, crudely etched with a blade of a knife, read the names of all their loved ones they had lost along the way. From top to bottom, it read, in loving memory, Beck, Seth, Jack, and, and Eugene, and finally, Thomas. Trevor then peered at the sky. It was overcast. It was always overcast. This new place they were in, although safe as it seemed, always held a dark, cloudy sky above. He was in a small, newly constructed neighborhood. The houses, all very small, each were identical. As he scanned the neighborhood, he noticed the other homes, exactly as his, a few rooms with a small back porch. And as they stood there together upon that small porch, Trevor noticed something beyond his small fence amidst a few bushes, a figure peering at him. He then noticed the figure gesture to him, pressing its finger to its lips. He looked around him to see if the kids were seeing the same thing he was, as he looked back toward the shadowy silhouette. Not wanting to alarm the little ones, Trevor slowly walked them inside the house. I'll be right back, okay? He said, closing them in and slowly looking back. But when he did, the figure was gone. Then, suddenly, without warning, it had re-emerged right on Trevor's patio, just feet away from where he stood. The figure was wearing thin brown cloth pants and a thin brown cloak with a hood. And then, as the stranger pulled his hood back, a face came into focus. It was a black man who held a strong jawline and was clean-shaven. I know you see them. We can see them too, the man said, as Trevor's intrigue now spiked beyond definable words. You want to know who they are. Trevor looked at the man while completely at a loss for words. He had so many questions. This was the first time anyone else had witnessed the dark figures that seemed to follow him from place to place. The stranger snapped Trevor from his trance as he began to speak once more. Well, the stranger said as Trevor stared at him in a silent state of shock. Finally, he was able to manage a quick nod in response to the man's proposal as the stranger continued. The dark objects you are seeing aren't really there. Chasing them would be like chasing a rainbow. You can see the colors fine, but as you move, the colors shift and become more distorted, eventually disappearing altogether. It's a computer program projecting itself across its investments. It's security software, kind of like loss prevention. The stranger kept speaking, every word scratching the back of Trevor's mind, reminding him of a dream he had once had. We call them cattle guards. They're not able to actually do anything other than surveillance, but that doesn't mean they're not dangerous. They can raise alarms, so I'm sure you can understand the benefits of having this ability to see them. Having this ability, though, is something that only a few possess. You see, these so-called open pastures back on Earth were too frightful for humans to handle. Assets were lost. If they weren't lost, they were often damaged. The Russians and cartels were not the ideal farmers. They leaned too heavily on their typical authoritarian-style management. 
Eventually, their client terminated the contract, turned to the Americans. Hopefully, for a more sustainable farm and more competent farmer. Trevor's mind began racing more than before. Back on Earth? Cattle guard? What was this stranger going on about? And why the hell was it eerily reminding Trevor of some kind of lost truth he once knew? The stranger continued speaking as Trevor listened more closely than he had ever listened to anyone before. That's right. We're not on Earth any longer. We are on a planet within the Alpha Centauri star system. Right now, you and I, and those little ones in your home. We're all on another planet, a planet called Darius. This put Trevor a little too far over his comfort zone, within theories he wasn't quite ready to be convinced of. This is the new open pasture, completely isolated, where they have full control. And when I say they, I don't mean these American soldiers. It's someone else who really sits at the top between all the different militarized forces and this client they all are vying for. A man named Arlo Brooks. Trevor's eyes opened as an expression of fear ran its course along his face, escorting with it a state of panic that began to take hold of his entire being as he asked himself several perplexing questions. Is it possible I'm really on another planet? Is this really not over? Questions stacked up with increasing speed as Trevor looked over at the man once more. But when he did, the man had disappeared. Suddenly Trevor heard a loud knock as he peered into his home through a window, where he saw Delilah and Caleb now focusing their attention on the front door. Trevor was immediately met with a feeling of unease as he re-entered his home through the back. What the hell was going on? Was he losing his mind? It all seemed to be so surreal. As he slowly made his way into his home, he quietly closed the door behind him and began walking across his living room while Caleb and Delilah wondered who it could be. He continued his path to the front door as his overflowing mind continued reeling. Who could this be? Eventually coming to the door, where they had all heard the obvious sounds of someone knocking, he paused. And realizing there still hadn't been a second knock, he thought to himself. Perhaps the visitor had left. But then, suddenly, and causing Trevor to slightly flinch, another round of knocking sounded off. He now looked down at the kids and gave them each a reassuring smile and slowly reached out to open it. And as the door began to open, a man came into view. That was when the hair on Trevor's neck began to stand on edge as the man on the other side of the open door was now fully in Trevor's sights. It was a blonde man with glasses and a mustache. He was wearing his typical business-like attire, sporting a jet black trench coat. And as Trevor's expression swiftly changed to complete and utter awe and shock, he recognized this man as an old companion of his. A father of a dear friend he once had. It was Seth's deceased dad, Thomas, and he now stood before Trevor, completely unscathed and in good health. And while holding a focused gaze upon this impossible sight, Thomas then greeted Trevor with a few choice words. Good evening, Mr. Meeks. You and I need to talk.